issues we examine in this program deal not only with the importance of global communication, but also the survival of culture and language in our increasingly globalized world. As global superpowers are relentlessly imposing their language, technology, and culture on the entire planet, what is the role of local language in indigenous culture in an increasingly globalized, interconnected world? Should countries yield to this increasing global homogenization, or is their value in local culture and languages used only by a small fraction of the world's people? Most importantly, is preservation of local language and culture mutually exclusive with establishing an international focus and participating in the global conversation? To understand these issues, several fundamental premises must be established. First, language is a defining quality of what it means to be human. Among the many qualities that make us human, none is more central than our universal human predisposition for language. Virtually any two-year-old human can acquire language with all its subtleties, complexities, and power. It is as natural for a child to acquire language as it is to grow teeth. Humans have been talking for hundreds of thousands of years and writing for thousands of years. Language gives us the ability to share thoughts and plans with other people, to pass along experiences across generations, and to symbolically and abstractly represent the world. Language creates bridges between people and across time. It gives us the ability to express our wishes and emotion, to persuade others, to create concepts, and to execute plans. Though there are 6,000 languages, including over 100 major ones that are widely spoken, they serve the same basic functions in every culture, though with slightly different flavors in each unique place. This leads to the second premise that language and culture are inextricably intertwined. Indeed, a defining quality of any culture is the language they speak. As separate cultures evolved, often in relative isolation, both their cultural customs and languages were passed on from generation to generation. Culture is so deep in the human psyche that it is often confused with human nature itself. The term second nature illustrates the depth of learned cultural customs. To violate cultural rules is more than offensive. People are often perceived as less than human if they don't adhere to their culture's customs. Humans are unique among living things in that they pass along cultural rules and customs to the next generation, including the proper ways to live, behave, and communicate. We all learn customs and languages of our family and our community. There are no known instances of a Colombian child spontaneously speaking Swahili, nor a Canadian child suddenly speaking Mandarin. Third, contact between cultures and languages is increasingly common and rapidly accelerating. As humans dispersed across the world's continents over the last million years, contact between cultures was relatively uncommon. Over 99% of human history, people lived in hunting and gathering bands. Meeting another unknown group or people was a frightening and potentially violent situation. In general, isolated people develop customs and means of communication unique to their group, but consistent with the abilities of all human beings. Humans have always traveled, which is why humans populated every part of every continent. 
About five to 10,000 years ago, migration increased. The first sailing vessels began to transport people and humans increasingly came in contact with people from different cultures that did not share their cultural customs, language, religion, or appearance. Peoples that had lived in virtual isolation from one another suddenly encountered each other with fabulous and disastrous consequences. Ideas, literacy, technology, and innovation spread more rapidly than ever. But so did conflict, cultural dominance, and disease. This trend has continued and accelerated. Today, humans are moving out of their ecological niche with the disruptive force of migration, travel, media, commerce, and internet communication. The global village that Marshall McLuhan discussed 50 years ago is here and contact with people who speak different languages and come from different cultures is commonplace. Most experts agree that we are moving toward a more interconnected, homogeneous world. A plethora of forces are acting to bring the world's people closer together in more constant contact and sharing elements of culture and language that are very different from their own. This will necessitate an increasingly global view that branches out from traditional ways of behaving and communicating that people have employed for centuries. What are the forces of global interconnection and homogenization? The Internet. Although many media have diffused foreign ideas, concepts, and words to the distant reaches of the planet, no force has been stronger than the Internet. With a click of a mouse, we can get news and weather, maps and texts, products and practices from every corner of the globe. It has linked us together, provided unprecedented information, disrupted traditional media and markets, and enabled a degree of networking, customs, politics, fashion, and entertainment have, that have been globalized, and this influence has produced a more connected and homogenized world. American media and cultural products, especially television and movies. The American cultural products have dominated world media for half a century. This influence from sports to fashion, from politics to pornography, from celebrities to community, consumer products, has spread across the globe, disrupting local traditions and economies and creating versions of the American dream for people across the globe. American celebrities like Michael Jordan, Brad Pitt, Oprah, and Madonna are known across the world, homogenizing and disrupting local luminaries and cultural customs. For better or worse, this influence has increased the power of democracy, materialism, capitalism, individualism, hedonism, and internationalism. Multinational corporations. International companies, especially American corporations, but also numerous European, European and Asian companies, are producing a more homogeneous consumer culture. This Coca-Colization and McDonaldization of the planet has made certain products recognizable and available throughout the world. One should only think of Starbucks coffee, Ericsson telephones, Samsung electronics, Microsoft software, Explorer browsers, Facebook social media, Budweiser beer, Google search engines, Mercedes trucks and cars, L'Oreal Cosmetics, Kleenex tissue or Nike shoes to really realize the degree to which all the world's people access and use the same product. Monolingualism. Knowledge of a single language is another force reducing cultural diversity 
in producing cultural and linguistic homogenization. In many countries, even developed ones like the United States, and in many marginally literate places as well, most people are monolingual. This produces homogenization within the culture as foreign languages are discouraged and other indigenous languages are inhibited. The result is a linguistic similarity throughout a country or continent. Similarly, some governments are cultural imperialists, insisting on cultural conformity, not only in language, but in politics, dress, food, and religion. Global capitalism. In the past several decades, the world has inexorably moved to a single global economy. Capitalism has permeated nearly every corner of the globe, and the unification of global markets has continued. Free trade zones, common markets, increased transportation, and instantaneous business-to-business -business communication has killed most local markets and replaced them with global ones. From steel to software, from olive oil to automobiles, production and consumption has been globalized and everyone, for better or worse, is in the same competitive arena. Transportation. The world is more connected than ever by automotive, ship, train, and especially airplane travel. The degree of interconnection is illustrated by the degree to which a deadly disease like Ebola or SARS can spread across continents in a matter of days. In most major world cities, it is commonplace to encounter tourists, business people, students, immigrants, and refugees. Here in San Diego, it is said that following any international crisis, refugees arrive in just a few days. Today, in several areas of the world, huge refugee camps house people fleeing oppression or war. At San Diego State University here in San Diego, between 5 and 10 percent of students each year are foreign. And in a recent class, I had students from nine different countries. World tourism is at an all-time high, with over one billion people in 2014 vacationing in another country. Transportation and travel has shrunk the world, and we are more likely than ever to encounter, influence, and be influenced by people from other lands. Fortunately, a number of forces also exist to maintain cultural and linguistic diversity in an increasingly global world. Cultural pride. Most people love, honor, and celebrate their own culture. For most people, culture is represented by our family, our childhood friends, and our home that all reinforce the same cultural artifacts and practices. In most places, people are proud of their country and culture. View any World Cup football game or the Tour de France, and most fans carry flags and other symbols of their country and culture. It is unlikely that global forces would cause Brazilians to lose their loyalty to Brazil or to give up Portuguese. Mexicans will not abandon their foods, their architecture, their music, or the Spanish language just because many Mexicans are players in the global village. As I've said many times, culture is second nature, as powerful as human nature itself. And it is nearly po impossible for people to lose their culture or language even when they become completely international and cosmopolitan. Narrow casting. If the 20th century was about broadcasting, the 21st century is about narrow casting. 
Cable and satellite television, the internet, and satellite radio give people millions of media choices. No longer do all people in a given region view the same programs and get the same information. People can choose programs on television or websites in their native language. They can choose information with their own political slant and view shows and get content, content about antiques, baseball, opera, finance, psychology, or any other topic. These abundant media choices are forces of heterogeneity and diversity. Instead of having one global dialogue, we have millions of different conversations going on about millions of topics in hundreds of languages, often preserving local practices and languages. Lack of language education. This is the monolinguistic side of the coin. Speaking only one language can also deter integration and promote localization and heterogeneation. Sadly, many of the world's people speak only one language. This is particularly true throughout North, Central, and South America, where most people speak only one language, Spanish, Portuguese, or English. One of the least multilingual places is the United States, where poor language instruction, linguistic arrogance, lack of global travel and exposure, and the global use of English have conspired to make the United States one of the most monolingual countries on earth. If it were not for Spanish-speaking immigrants to the United States, the U.S. would be almost completely monolingual. Fortunately for the U.S., many of the world's people speak English, but increasingly the lack of second and third languages will put the United States at a disadvantage in commerce, national security, military intelligence, and education, particularly when interacting with other large monolingual countries like France, China, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Brazil, Spain, Russia, the United Kingdom, and most of Latin America. Except for a few people that speak indigenous language in the Americas, most countries in South, Central, and North America are monolingual. It is important to mention here the concept of English language proficiency as a work skill, not as a second language. If English language proficiency is viewed as a global competence, meaning as an indispensable tool for global productivity, then the idea of acquiring this skill could be more attractive to native language speakers. The problem I see with English language acquisition uh, today is conceptual. For example, Mexicans don't need a second language called English because they already speak Spanish. Instead, they need w a work skill called English. Under this concept, English language education is approached from a more practical perspective. Culture can still be transmitted through native language and English can be used solely as a tool for global productivity. Systematic efforts for preserving culture and language. To prevent the decline or death of languages, a number of language preservation organizations have been established throughout the world. Se several thousand languages have only a few thousand speakers. Systematic efforts by groups attempt to preserve these obscure languages through recordings and teaching the younger generation to speak the language. Preserving the language is essentially an effort to preserve the culture, customs, stories, and oral traditions in the culture. Even where well-established languages are thriving in smaller countries like the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway, 
The schools all teach the local language along with English to preserve the national language and culture. Even major languages spoken across the world are concerned about the hegemony of English as the threat to their own language. Perhaps the best example is the Francophone Conference, or OIF. It is an international organization with 57 member nations and 23 observer nations to preserve French language, culture, products, and customs, and to create a market for French music, television, movies, and books, and to promote human rights, democratic governance, poverty reduction, peace, and sustainable development. Every two years, the OIF has an international convention and summit meeting designed to maintain French language and culture and exchange media products and discuss concerns. No such organization exists for Spanish, but the Spanish language is alive, well, and expanding. Spanish is one of the most spoken languages in the world. In terms of total number of speakers, Spanish only follows behind Chinese, English, and Hindi languages, and like English, is much more geographically diverse than Hindi or Chinese. Combining the total number of native speakers and those who speak uh, Spanish language as a second language, over 400 million individuals are speaking Spanish globally. Here in the United States, Spanish has become the second language and is widely spoken throughout the country. Many Latin Americans are attempting to have the next generation in the United States to be bilingual, to learn English and Spanish. This effort is meeting with considerable success, and many Hispanic people, especially young people, are completely bilingual. Tribalism and Balkanization Throughout the world, the ancient cultures and tribes are still very evident. Sadly, this has led to religious, cultural, and tribal conflict, terrorism, and warfare across the world in the Balkans, the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, South Asia, Canada, the United Kingdom, but to a lesser degree in South America and Mexico. These reprehensible ethnic conflicts may nonetheless have been a force that has prevented increased cultural homogenization. The breakup of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union into former ethnic states, for better or worse, may have preserved the ethnic identity of groups like Slovakians, Serbs, Ukrainians, Kazakhs, and Turkmen, to mention but a few. While ethnic and religious tribalism may represent a threat to regional and world peace, these divisions have preserved cultural traditions of groups that were formally assimilated into larger countries with little consideration for cultural uniqueness. Resegregation. In many diverse countries, people voluntarily resegregate into their ethnic, racial, or cultural groups that preserve cultural and ethnic uniqueness. The French in Canada, Islamic people in Europe, African Americans in the United States, and Europeans and Native Americans in Mexico are all example of people voluntarily or involuntarily maintain their cultural and linguistic uniqueness by associating with people like themselves. While integration of these groups may be a desirable outcome, the maintenance of their distinctiveness is a force that resists homogenization and global uniformity. The Singapore example is interesting. They experienced the negative effects of desegregation 30 years ago when their Chinese, Indian, Malaysian, and native populations broke off into neighborhoods much like New York did in the beginning of the last century. Since the leadership did not like the New York example, they created a law 
that force all neighborhoods to be diverse, meaning that limits of 25% occupation were set up for the four major ethnic groups in every neighborhood. After 30 years, the strategy has really seemed to work. Less ethnic tensions are seen than before, less crime, more acceptance, etc., to the point where Singapore is now considered one of the best integrated melting pots of Asia. In conclusion, the new economy has emerged with the proliferation of new information and telecom technologies and the explosion of new knowledge led by the eight most advanced industrial countries in the world. There is no doubt that English will continue to be the premier language of global business and communication. But language and cultural diversity will be increasingly essential as the world economy continues to decentralize and grow beyond the richest and emerging countries of today. We should never forget that the strength of our world society is its diversity and the complementarity of cultures and resources. It is essential that we all recognize the global dynamics of language homogenization and heterogeneity that I've described above so that we can better understand and make the proper decisions for our respective organizations and communities. Let's all learn to communicate effectively without losing our identities for the good of our shared existence. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Anderson. Let's now go to module two of this program.